you bring your book tonight? The word. Hey, you know what? Um, I was walking down the uh, Christian Ed hallway this morning before service, and a couple young ladies caught up with me and said, Pastor, we've got you a card, a Valentine's card. And uh, I won't say their names, but I want to I read what they wrote. And this is for Levi, because Wednesday he told me I'm an old person preacher. He said, I'm an old people's preacher. This is what they wrote. They said, thank you for being the best preacher in town. For all the hard work and commitment you put into preaching every Sunday and Wednesday. I tell you what, that is darling. Thank you, young ladies. You <laughs> Thank you, young ladies. That meant so much. Hey, folks, that made my day. I don't know. I don't know. I know you've heard better preaching, but let me believe this. Just let me believe this. All right, we're going to Habakkuk chapter 3. Oh, praise God. We're going to read a few verses here, 17 through 19. And uh, see if we can go to work here in this text or on this topic for a few minutes. Kiddos, uh, winter warm-up is coming up at the end of the month, so you need to see Brother Sebastian. Uh, if you plan to go and make those plans, let him know. Uh, so, uh, so we can plan accordingly. All right. Why don't we stand one more time for the word? Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Habakkuk writes and he says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. What he has just described there is even greater than a stock market crash. Hmm? Israel was, their whole economy was built on agriculture. And here everything is nothing. But notice verse 18. I want us to read this verse together. In concert, audible voice. Would you read it with me? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. One more time. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He goes on to say the Lord is my strength. And he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. I want to share with you on the subject of praise. Don't dress it up. Just give it up. Don't dress it up. Just give it up. Can we do that for a moment? Father, tonight... We're going to praise you. We're going to worship you. Our hearts rejoice in you. We may not be able to rejoice in anything else around us. But one thing is certain. We can rejoice in our salvation. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, come on, church. Let's just take a moment, shall we? 
Just take a moment. Just praise Him. Just worship Him. We honor You, Lord. We honor You, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, how great You are. How worthy You are, Jesus. How worthy You are, Jesus. Oh, praise Your name, Lord. Praise Your name, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I give you worship, Lord. I give you praise. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. I know you're saying, didn't you just preach on praise a few weeks ago? At the first of the year. Yeah, I did. So, I don't know. I uh, I don't know if this maybe is just something the Lord has been dealing with me personally about. And uh, maybe it's just uh, I'm speaking to you tonight out of the overflow of what he's been speaking to me personally about. And uh, But however it is. Um, if you'll just indulge me, I want to share in it uh, on this topic again this evening. How many would agree, and we can agree because I think this is taken uh, from multiple passages, the fact that praising God is always appropriate. And praising God is always effective. Pastor, you mean even when my cat dies? Yeah. Even when the cat dies. Pastor, you mean even when my run has slowed down to a crawl? My shout has died down to a whimper? Yeah. Praising God is always effective and appropriate. In fact, the point I want us to embrace tonight is the power of praise is actually magnified when we offer it to God when it doesn't make any sense to be offering it. I'm going to run that by you again. The power of praise is magnified when we offer it to God, when it doesn't really make sense to offer it. Can I ask, has anybody been there? Some may be there right now. Some may be in a situation like the prophet Habakkuk. If you haven't been there, you will be. Just keep on living. Right? The truth is life comes to all of us with built-in problems. Right? And we might as well understand that we're not going to get through this life without trouble, without hardships, without pain, without getting our heart broken at least once or twice. We're not going to get through this life without being lied on, persecuted, despised. Then throw in some betrayal, some treacherous deception, put all that into the equation and it can get real ugly real quick hmm? all you have to do is look in the in your bibles and you'll see what i'm talking about for example <clears throat> david was a great man of god he was a great king he was a worshiper but how many know that did not exempt him from pain? No, it didn't. 
If you study David's life, you'll see a man who endured mucho pain. Hmm? And then look at Job. He was a righteous man, but he endured more grief and pain than would seem humanly possible. I could go on and on, but I believe the point is clear. Sometimes life just hurts us. Sometimes you're in the pit like Joseph. Sometimes you're in the fire like Shadrach. Sometimes you're on the mountain calling down fire from heaven. Sometimes you're in the cave hoping and praying that Jezebel doesn't find you. Hmm? There are just some things it, that happen to all of us just because we all live in a fallen world. Hello. Now, you better buckle your seat belts. Maybe a little turbulent. Let me say that again. There are just some things that happen to all of us just because we're living in a fallen world. There is no other explanation needed other than that one. I wish some people would remember that the next time they go on their social media site and just start to bleed all over. Hello. I, I've been appalled at some of the depressive posts some Christians who are old enough to know better, post on their social networking sites. I'm really surprised that they've not driven themselves to drinking. <laughs> because from what they write about, it makes me depressed. I just about have to go get a drink. That's a joke. Okay. That's called hyperbole. Hello. It's never, never, never happened, okay? I've never, never had to do that. Never went that direction. Never even tipped. Ugh. But I will never understand why experienced followers of Christ will go on public social platforms and they question God, they cast disparaging remarks about events in their lives and then think they're going to win others over to their gospel of depression and their spiritual funk. Hello. Man, I just wish some of them, I just want to say, you need to ask yourself before you hit that post button and say, will this bring glory to God? Well, pastor, I'm just being transparent. I, it feels good to vent. Yeah, but you sure make a mess of things. How's that venting working for you? Hmm? And I want to say there's some things that should only be said to God in your prayer closet or in counseling with a trusted godly confidant. Oh, my goodness. We got to move on. Say, move on, pastor. <clears throat> Hey, but I do want to say that was totally free advice. I did not charge you a thing for that gold nugget I just dropped in your pocket. But the truth is, there are some things that are going to happen to all of us just because we live in a fallen world. Don't take it personal. Amen. Don't think God has got it out for you. Okay, so there's some things that's just going to happen because we're living in fall. Then there are some things, though, that are demonic yes. in nature. There are some things that happen to us that are attacks straight out of hell. And our adversary, the devil, goes about as a snarling lion seeking to inflict pain and devastation. John 10.10 10 tells us he's a thief. He cometh but does what? Steal. Kill destroy and I said all this to get to this point there will be times in your life when praise is not going to make any sense hmm? 
I need to repeat that. There's going to be times in your life when praising God is not going to make any sense. When we talk about making sense of something, we mean that it is understandable or that it is agreeable to what's before us. It is logical. It's reasonable. But this man of God, Habakkuk, was doing something that didn't make any sense. He was standing in the midst of, of economic and social chaos and, and the standing in the midst of loss and emptiness and confusion and disappointment. And he did something that sent shockwaves through hell. And it sent applause through heaven. Oh, hallelujah. He said, yet... Regardless of what's going on around me, I am going to rejoice. Basically what he was saying is, hey, I've decided I'm going to praise God even when it doesn't make sense. I may be going through a season of sickness. I may be grieving over the loss of a loved one. Or I may be walking through the fire of family turmoil. I may be crying myself to sleep at night over my prodigal son or daughter. They, listen, they may be threatening foreclosing on the house. The depot, uh, uh, the repo depot just towed my car. Listen, my company's downsizing and, and they're going to let me go or... or Hello? Or my youth pastor just resigned. Did I say that? <laughs> Hello? Oh, man, I can't. You say, I can't believe he went there. I went there. Hmm? Child of God, what are we going to do? Let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to let my feelings and my emotions take over. I'm not going to go into a deep spiritual depression. I'm not going to run to the refrigerator and try to drown my sorrow in my favorite comfort food. Hello? I'm not going to overdose on prescription meds. I'm not going to get angry at God and accuse Him of not loving me and not caring about me to all my social media friends. No, sir. No, ma'am. I'm going to do what David did. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord if I have to when there's nobody else that will encourage you. you just got to encourage yourself in the Lord. I'm going to go to the Lord and I'm going to say, God, the things may not look good, but I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on my garment of praise and I'm going to strip off the garment of heaviness. Somebody needs to shake the spirit of heaviness in this house tonight and you need to wrap yourself in the garment of praise. Praise God. Somebody shake that garment of heaviness off and put on the garment of praise. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to do battle tonight. I've been praying and thinking about this. Somebody needs to open your mouth, and you need to start praising God. Somebody needs to give God some praise that's really do His name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. God never promised us a problem-free life, but He did say, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And listen, and when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Listen, God never promised us a problem-free life, but he did say in Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers out of them all. Somebody raise your hands and praise him. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, I'm feeling better. Hey. Let me, let me stop right here and tell you that the church world as a whole is filled with what we would call pretty Praisers. Hmm? Hmm? I'm talking about people that they'll praise God when everything's pretty. 
Hello? When the weather's nice, the bills are paid, all the children are saved, and they're making A's and B's in school. When the health diagnosis is good, they got money in the bank, oh, they're quick to give him praise then. Hello. Pretty praisers. Their face never gets scrunched up. They don't ever cry. They don't ever get their clothes out of sorts. Huh? Their wig never gets twisted. Huh? They wouldn't jump and shout and dance in the spirit if this church was on fire. Hello. But I'm going to tell you something that might surprise you. God would rather have your ugly praise than your pretty praise. Oh, help this preacher preach. I said God would really rather prefer your ugly praise to your pretty praise. It doesn't take any faith in God, any effort to praise God when everything's going great. Hmm? Oh, yes, we definitely praise God during those times. But what really needs... What really gets heaven's attention and what really paralyzes hell is ugly praise. The praise that doesn't make any sense. It's senseless praise. That praise that runs down your face in the form of a tear because your heart's been broken, but you'll praise God anyway. It's the praise that you have to reach way down deep in your soul for. It's the praise that's hard work. It's ugly. It's not pretty. But God inhabits that kind of praise. You know, the dictionary defines ugly praise. Not really ugly praise. Let me rephrase that. Defines ugly I don't think you're going to find ugly praise in the dictionary. I don't think Webster comments on that. The dictionary defines ugly as very unattractive, unpleasant to look at, offensive in the sense of beauty, displeasing in appearance. And here's the last one, messy, messy, huh? See, pretty praisers get uncomfortable around ugly praisers. Because ugly praisers are not worried about winning a beauty contest. Hmm? They're just trying to hang on to their sanity in the middle of a storm. Oh, hallelujah. The pretty praisers have a problem with real praise because real praise can get loud. Hmm? I said real praise can get messy. Huh? But God says it's time to quit worrying about trying to pretty it up. Just give it up. I, I'm telling somebody personally, I've been in some ugly situations. And I'll tell you the truth, there wasn't a pretty praise anywhere around me. All my praise during that time was ugly. Hello. But God loves that ugly praise. Go ahead and give him some praise. Huh? I said, go ahead and give him some praise. It may be a little messy, but it's beautiful in his ears. I said, it's beautiful to him. Can I introduce you to a couple other ugly praisers in the Bible besides Habakkuk? First, there was Job, Job chapter 1, verse 1. Job was a perfect man, upright, feared the Lord, eschewed evil. Then we see how just 10 verses later, he lost everything. All this tragic news hits him in a matter of 10 short verses. What did Job do? It wasn't pretty. Huh? The Bible says he tore his mantle Hmm? in a sign of desperation and grief. Hey, 
his family except his wife had just been wiped out. Hmm? His 401k. His retirement. Hello. It wasn't in the stocks on Wall Street. It was in the stocks in his field. They're gone. The Bible says he tore his mantle. He shaved his head. But what did he do? He fell on his face. And the Bible says he worshiped. That was some ugly praise. Hello? Let's look at another ugly praiser in Scripture. 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 7. David and his men has just returned from a military campaign. They found the city, Ziklag, that they returned to, that they had left all of their family. It is burned with fire. Their wives, their children, sons, daughters have all been taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him, read it for yourself, 1 Samuel 30. It says they lifted up their voices and wept. It says they wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been there? Cried so many tears, you couldn't cry anymore? And then it says David was greatly distressed. Notice this. It says, for the people, his own men, spoke of stoning him. Because it goes on to say, the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. Boy, that was an ugly, messy situation, wasn't it? But keep reading. Is everyone around him was thinking, oh, if I, if I, if I see David, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to just pick up a stone and just hit him good. The Bible says David found him a place. I don't know if it was his prayer closet. I don't know where he was, but he found a place to encourage himself in the Lord. This was where David gave God some ugly praise. Huh? No doubt David was physically exhausted. He didn't look like a great warrior, much less a great worshiper. His eyes were probably swollen and bloodshot. But what he did turned everything around. I said what he did turned everything. Right there in the middle of that pain, he gave God some praise that did not make sense. He worshipped. I said he worshipped. And God how God does what he does. But God gave him a supernatural turnaround and he recovered every single soul that the enemy had stolen from him and his... Oh, glory to God. I'm starting to feel like an... Uh, I feel like some ugly praise may be in this place tonight. Let me speak to somebody right here because you're, you're not in a pretty situation. Things don't look good for you, but I want you to know, go ahead, give God some ugly praise. I feel like somebody in here is just maybe one ugly praise away from a breakthrough. Does that make sense? I said you are one ugly praise away from a supernatural turnaround. One ugly praise away from a prodigal coming home. One ugly praise away from a brand new anointing. From a brand new blessing. One ugly praise away from a healing that has been long time coming. Listen, let me introduce you. There's somebody that needs to give up some ugly praise. You're saying, oh, like what I'm going through, Pastor. I wish I could change this. Go ahead, give God some praise. Go ahead, get his attention. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody right now, just give him some praise with all your heart. Would you do that? Woo. 
Hallelujah. 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 Don't you dress it up. Just give it up. I said, don't you dress it up. Just give it up, God. This is not going to be pretty. In fact, this is pretty messy. But I'm going to give it to you because it's all I have. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Let's took let's uh, take a look at another another two, maybe a couple more ugly praisers. We know them as Brother Paul and Brother Silas. Find them in Acts chapter 16. I'm telling you. Brother, sister, they are working their little hearts out for the Lord. The hmm? Bible says they're preaching. People are being saved. And here comes a certain young lady possessed with a spirit of divination. Hello. She's a psychic. And she begins to follow them around and she says things like, These men are servants of the Most High God. They show unto us the way of salvation. And the Bible says this she did many days. Paul put up with it a few days. After a while, it got on his last nerve. Hmm? Scripture says it this way, Paul being Grieved. You don't want to get Paul grieved. Hello. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to that spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. Hallelujah. The Bible says it came out the self same hour. But that's not the end of the story. When her employers when those that were in charge of the psychic hotline when they saw that the hope of their financial gain was gone it says they caught Paul and Silas began to publicly accuse them as as being troublemakers and before long a riot breaks out. Everybody turns on Paul and Silas, and the magistrates rush in. They get a hold of Paul and Silas, rip their clothes off, beat them with stripes, many stripes, and throw them in the inner prison and put their feet in stocks. That's messy. That's ugly. But we see these two praisers, ugly praisers, in darkness, in the midnight, humiliated. Backs are beaten black and blue. Their clothes have been ripped and shredded. But around midnight, Paul looks at Silas. Silas looks at Paul and says, we might as well pray. We might as well sit. You got any songs on your heart, Si? Hmm? And right there in that mess, they gave God some praise, and it wasn't pretty. Hmm? It was praise that didn't make any sense. Right there in the midst of pain. Right there in the darkness. Oh, you don't have any idea what those prison cells, they were dungeons. Hmm? Most of us would have been crying, moaning, groaning, complaining trying to decide whether ministry was really worth it or not. Hello? Right there, though, 
they began to choose ugly praise. And through the humiliation, through the tears and the fears and the pain, they might not have passed the qualifications for the Broadway Assembly Church Choir. Hello. But there was something about their praise that our God took a liking to. Verse 26 says, suddenly, as soon as their ugly praise worked its way to heaven, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of that prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. The jailer and his whole family experienced the grace of God that night, were saved and baptized. I didn't make this up, beloved. It's in the book. It all happened because two men were not ashamed to give God some ugly praise, to praise God when it didn't make any sense. Can I have two men? Can I have two men stand wherever you are and start to give God some praise? Just go ahead. There's a couple right back there. There. Oh, hallelujah. There's more than two. Oh, hallelujah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do we have some, some Paul and Silas? Hallelujah. Things are not looking the best. In fact, things have been better in my house. Things have been better in my life. But here I am. I'm in the presence of God. And I'm going to give Him some praise. It may not be pretty. It may not be the most beautiful praise God's ever seen. But it's what I got. And it's what God's going to get. Hallelujah. Praise Him, guys. Praise Him. Hallelujah. God, I like what I feel. I said, I like what I feel. He's inhabiting the praises of his people. Ooh. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I bless your name, Jesus. I bless your name, Jesus. See from that story right there, Paul and Silas, it says all the prisoners heard them. All the prisoners heard them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Some of you, some of us guys, we're pretty reserved. And we're like, okay, God, we'll praise you. But I don't want to say it too loud. I don't want anybody to listen. Listen, there's probably some prisoners right here tonight. Hello. I said there's some prisoners right in here tonight who need to hear you praise God. They need to hear you worship in the midst of your mess. And listen, it'll do more for them just as much as it'll do for you. It loosed all their bonds. Listen, that's what the Scripture says. Even the prisoners, not just Paul and Silas, all of their prisoners' bonds were broke, hallelujah, through the power of two men giving some ugly praise. Oh, go ahead and praise Him right where you're at. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I already mentioned him once. Let me, let me look at him one more time, David. Let's go back to the incident where he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. He becomes overwhelmed. See, that Ark, that Ark had not been in its home for many, many months. Since Saul had decided to take it into battle and use it as a good luck charm. And the Philistines captured it. They got it back. But you know the story. It couldn't come all the way back to Jerusalem. They had a detour when Uzzah got killed. And they was like, oh, 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 let's not go any further. Anybody around here want to take this ark in? 
And so it goes into Obed-Edom's house. And so now it's been the dream of David that ark needs to come back to where it belongs. And finally, it's actually becoming to, it's beginning to materialize. And so David, he starts praising God. Why? Because he seems, sees his dream come to pass. And he just gets excited. He gets overwhelmed with thanksgiving. And he starts to dance. He starts to rejoice. He starts shouting like a Pentecostal. Huh? And the Bible says, hey, he, the Bible says he danced right out of his kingly apparel. Huh? Hello. I've never shouted my coat off. I can't imagine. It would take some, some praise. But he, he danced right out of his kingly apparel, the Bible says. Do you think that was all there was to that story? Well, look what happens when some ugly praise shows up. 2 Samuel 6, 20, it says, And afterwards David returned to bless his household. He's all fired up. He's all encouraged. And his little honey deer meets him at the door. Michael, the daughter of Saul. Comes to meet him, the Bible says, and said. Now, this is sarcastically. Oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself in the eyes of the handmaids, in the eyes of the servants, like one of the vain fellows who shamelessly uncovered himself. And David's heart has to sink. Now, David could have said, Honey, you're right. Hmm. On second thought, dear, that was, that was embarrassing. I'm sorry I did that. It was no way for a king to act. I, honey, I should have kept my kingly composure. I should have behaved myself in a more dignified manner. I'm sorry I embarrassed you. Please forgive me. I said he could have said that, but he didn't. Hmm? You look at verse 21 and 22. He says, he says, honey, let's get something straight. I wasn't dancing for you. I wasn't dancing for the servants and the handmaidens. I was dancing for the Lord. Did you hear me, honey? I wasn't dancing for you. I was dancing for the Lord. He goes on to say, who chose me and made me king over Israel. It was not a proudful dance. It was a humble dance because he knew he would have not been in that position had it not been for the Lord. Hmm? And then he goes on to say something like, if you thought that praise was over the top, honey, if you thought it was distasteful and ugly, you might need to go call your shrink and schedule your next appointment. Because you ain't seen nothing yet. Hallelujah. I said, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't really understand it all, but I know it's true. There's something powerful in praise uh, that comes from you being in the middle of a terrible circumstance. Uh, God responded to Paul and Silas's ugly praise, uh, and he shook that jail off of its foundation. Uh, God responded to Job's ugly praise uh, and gave him back double everything he lost. Uh, after three days and three nights uh, in a whale motel, Jonah, the Bible says, in the belly of that well gives God some praise and 
sitting in the whale's belly, covered in seaweed. Here's what Jonah said in chapter 2, verse 9. I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. And I will pay my vow for salvation is of the Lord. He didn't say that when he was out on the beach. He said that when he was in the belly of the whale. Then verse 10 says, The Lord then spoke unto the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. What am I saying? I'm saying when Jonah gave God some ugly praise, some praise that didn't make any sense, God told that whale, spit him out. When ugly praise filled that whale's belly, it made him sick. It nauseated him and he spit Jonah out. Listen, anybody in here want to make the devil angry? You want to nauseate the enemy? Listen, you start giving some praise in the middle of his attack. I said, you start giving him some praise. It may not come out pretty. It may come out ugly. But I believe if you'll give God some praise, something will happen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I praise your name, Lord. I praise your name, Lord. I praise your name. So I got to quit. Woo! See, happiness is not something you pursue as much as something you get as a byproduct of pleasing God. You want true fulfillment? Please God. If God is if God is pleased, listen, it's going to be because you gave him your highest praise in your lowest times. I said you gave him your highest praise. In your lowest times. God is beautiful in his splendor and his holiness and in his sanctuary. I mean, no, everything is beautiful in heaven. Huh? I believe the music is beautiful. I believe the people are beautiful. Listen, and once your praise gets there, it doesn't remain ugly praise. It's beautiful. I said it's beautiful. To the ears of the Lord. So look right here. Habakkuk said, okay, God, I get it. I get it. And he runs down through the plan. He's a prophet. And God's revealed to him what's going to happen. The Babylonians will attack us. Okay, God, I got that. So after the Babylonians attack us, you're going to judge them? Yeah. Habakkuk, that's true. Okay, Lord, I'm going to wait. I'll wait for that to happen. But as it turns out, Habakkuk most likely didn't live long enough because Babylon would not fall for almost 70 years. He, he no doubt got to see Israel taken captive but he didn't get to see the Babylonians judged. Man, I wanted to see them get their, what's coming them, Lord. I wanted to see them get their due. But here's what he's realized. That doesn't matter. Habakkuk says, if I don't ever see that yet, I will rejoice. And the word rejoice there in the Hebrew literally means to jump for joy. Huh? We might even say it means to dance in the spirit. How is this possible? Habakkuk has just described a total economic meltdown. Ancient Israel being an agricultural society, if you ran out of figs, olives, grapes, grain, sheep, cattle, you were in big trouble. This is not a random list he has in the text, folks. This was their livelihood. Listen, let me ask you, what if, what if your investments disappeared tomorrow? 
your whole portfolio. Huh? What do you do when you get wiped out? What if your investments disappear? Recently, the stock market, they tell us, hit an all-time high. Let me pose a question. What would we do tomorrow if the stock market imploded? What if it totally tanked and went from an all-time high to the all the way to zero? What would we do then, church? What would we do? Investments gone, pensions gone, 4OK wiped out, what then? How are we going to face that? What if our children end up in jail? What if you lose your job? What if your safety net fails? Huh? What if you, I mean, what if it gets so bad you run out of cheese and crackers? That's bad. Hello. What if you can't pay your bills? What if your loved one never comes to Christ? What if the doctor says it's terminal? What if your spouse has a heart attack, God forbid, and leaves you alone? What if you lose your job because you're a Christian? What if we end up in jail for our faith, like our two ugly praisers did, Paul and Silas? Listen, too many Christians have a God of the good times. Hmm? I said they have a God of the good times. They serve a God and love him and praise him when everything's going well. But what will we do when the hard times come? If all we have is a God of the good times, then we don't have the God of the Bible. Hello. The fact is, sometimes the fig tree is not going to blossom. Sometimes there's going to be no grapes on the vine. Sometimes the olive crop is going to fail. Sometimes the fields will produce no food. Sometimes there will be no sheep in the fold. Sometimes there will be no cattle in the stalls. What are we going to do then? Are we going to get angry with God and we're going to give up? Are we going to choose to praise Him in the good times and in the bad? See, often we mistake faith for feelings. Hmm? Faith is not about my feelings, much less about my circumstances. Faith chooses to believe when it would be easier to not believe. Habakkuk said two things. I'll wait patiently. And secondly, I'm going to rejoice. He found new strength in the midst of desolation. Faith chooses to believe when it doesn't make sense to believe. The last verse of Habakkuk is often overlooked, but I read it to you in the text. He closes with this, the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places. Oh, I'm in a low place right now. I said I may be in a low place right now. But by the strength of the Lord, I will rise. I said, I will rise and I will walk on. He says, my feet will, that speaks of the journey through life. If you have ever traveled to the Holy Land, you probably saw the deer scampering on the barren hills near the west side of the Dead Sea. Listen, those deer are sure-footed where the rest of us would slip and slide and eventually fall off the, the cliffs. Uh, uh, if, if we know the Lord, Habakkuk is saying, he's going to give us stability. In the slippery times, in the slippery moments of life, he will give us stability and he will give us grace to stand when everybody else is fallen. Somebody raise your hands, praise him. I said, raise your hands and praise him. 